Well, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Haggai chapter 2, if you haven't done so already. Haggai chapter 2, 10 is where we will be today, and we'll go through verse 19. I hope you've been able to join us the last two weeks since we started this study in Haggai. If you've not missed any, maybe you can catch it later if you did miss one of the weeks. I'm going to our website and looking at one of those previous sermons. But today, we find the people of God in Haggai. They're three months into their work on the temple. All the time stamps are very helpful to know exactly when this is happening. This is two months after the last sermon that Haggai preached. We're three months from when the building began. And over and over What has struck me in this book is God's commitment to his people, his commitment to them. Pastor Justin alluded to this at the beginning of our service, but in chapter one, remember what's going on. We found God's people, they were apathetic towards their God. Because of that, they're apathetic towards his commands, towards his priorities. And well, the Lord reveals to them this, and at the end of the chapter, he graciously stirs them up through his word, and they begin to work on the temple. In chapter 2, we saw that God's people, one month after the rebuilding started, they're, they're now busy with the work on the temple, and yet the Lord reveals to them their discouragement in their work, and as they're looking around at their work, they're beginning to realize that the work that they're doing doesn't appear as spectacular as the previous temple, as the first temple, as Solomon's temple. And the Lord encourages them. After he reveals their discouraged hearts to them, he then encourages them to be strong three times. Be strong, be strong, be strong. He promises that he is with them in this work. And at the end of last week's sermon... In 2 verse 9, the Lord makes a very important promise. If you underline in your Bible, th- verse two, chapter 2 verse 9 is a really important verse in this book. It is a very important promise that the Lord gives them. And what he says to them is that the, actually the latter glory of this temple, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former glory of it. And then he says, in that latter, more glorious temple, he would give peace, he says. And here we come today, smack dab in the middle of chapter 2, and here the Lord's going to speak to them, a third oracle, third sermon through the prophet Haggai. He's going to reveal a deeper problem, a problem in their hearts. And what we've seen, though, throughout this whole book is the Lord, catch this, the Lord shepherding his people, caring for them, drawing out the condition of their hearts and continuing to lead them forward in his grace. That's one of the things that the Lord has shown me through this study in Haggai. I'd love to talk with more of you afterwards about what the Lord's been showing you through this series in Haggai. But in my own life, as I've reflected on this book, I've really thought, wow, where would I be without the Lord revealing himself to me, without the Lord in my life, without the Lord shepherding sovereign care for me in my life, where would I be? Have you ever asked yourself that question? This next week, especially during Thanksgiving, I encourage you to ask yourself and that question, reflect on that. Where, where would you be, where would any of us be without the sovereign shepherding care of our God in our lives? As I was reflecting on that this past week, the thing that occurred to me is when I think about that, how the Lord has taken care of me, how he's shepherded me throughout my life, I don't know if you're anything like me, sometimes I'm tempted to think about the moments when I was weakest 
and the Lord comes into my life and strengthens me. Or the moments when I find myself most discouraged and he comes and encourages me. Or I think about those moments when there was a huge financial expense in my life and I wasn't sure how ends were going to meet. And then the Lord graciously provided. Or we think about our, our spiritual blessings, right? I was dead in my sin and God mercifully brought me to life, right? These are really great things to think about. We should all think about things like this. Um, but these aren't the only ways that God intervenes in our lives, is it? These ways are not the only way that God shepherds us. And the, the, what the book of Haggai has shown me, and I hope he's been showing us, all of us, is that God also blesses us. And God also loves us by disciplining us. By revealing things in us that are not pretty. By shepherding us and leading us through the valley of the shadow of death. From a New Testament example, consider Hebrews chapter 12 with me. Just a couple of verses. The writer of Hebrews here is quoting Proverbs 3. He writes, My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or be weary when reproved by him. I think that's my problem. I tend to be weary. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. I tend to think when the Lord is disciplining me, he's pushing me away. That the Lord chastises those he receives, the text says. Then verse 11 says something amazing. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And oftentimes, in these more painful moments in our lives, they are so unexpected to us. And we certainly wouldn't plan them, but God knows better than us. He knows everything we need. He knows what we need to hear when we go to him in his word. And the promise of Hebrews 12, verse 11, stands for us. And I want us to remember that promise that these difficult times will bring spiritual fruit into our lives. We should be grateful for these moments, too. Where would I be? Where would any of us be without the sovereign shepherding care of God in our lives? I don't even want to think about it. Today in our passage, God's people are going to be given painful, unexpected news. We're going to hear again about difficulties, curses, that God has brought into their lives. And we're going to see that through all of it, God has a loving and shepherding and gracious purpose for his people. If you're taking notes, our big idea for today is this. Unholiness, unholiness defiles the human heart. But God, in his great mercy and love, bestows unmerited favor upon his covenant people. Holiness defiles the human heart, but God in his great mercy and love bestows unmerited favor upon his covenant people. So if apathy was the issue that gripped God's people in chapter 1 and discouragement is what consumed them in chapter 2, today we're going to see that it's defilement. It's the underlying issue, the deeper issue of the heart. The Lord Almighty is going to come to his people through the prophet Haggai. He's going to show them that even though all of their ways seem pure in their own eyes, the Lord knows the condition of their hearts. The Lord sees every motive in their hearts. 
what we're going to see in these first four verses. Our first point is this, that God's people are defiled and without hope. It's our first point for today. And I want to just start by reading the first three verses with us, 10 through 13. If you have your Bible, look there with me. On the 24th day of the ninth month, on the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who's unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Two questions, two questions that they're asked, that they're, that they're supposed to ask the priest. Summary of the two answers of the questions, okay? Easy summary. The answer to the first question is, no, it's not holy. The answer to the second question is, yes, it is defiled, okay? It's just a summary. No, it's not holy. The answer to the second, yes, it is defiled. What are these verses speaking about? It's kind of like when we enter a verse, some verses like this, and we're living under the new covenant, it is like, whoa, what is, what's going on? The background of these verses can be found in Exodus 29 and 30. And in Numbers chapter 6, if you want to jot that down in notes, you can go later, read those passages. Exodus 29 through 30, number 6, we're told in those passages about stipulations in the sacrificial system. We're given instructions about ritual purity and defilement in passages like those. And this is, again, under the Old Covenant. And here the people of Israel, during Haggai's prophecy, are to ask the priest. The priests were the day-to-day -day teachers of the law at this time. Prophets came in for a specific time, spoke the word of the Lord, but they weren't always with them. The priests were the day-to-day -day teachers of the law. Haggai says, ask the priests. They're the experts on this matter. They're, asked, they're to ask the priests about a possible transfer or conveying of holiness to an object, from one object to another object. And under the old covenant, holiness could be conveyed from a primary object like the altar or a utensil that had been consecrated, or as it says here, holy meat that had been consecrated, and holiness could be transferred from that primary object to a secondary object, such as the garment of a priest. But here's the thing, under the old covenant, it couldn't be passed to a third object, a tertiary object. So it wouldn't make the priest himself holy. There was another process for how he would become holy. And that's what this question is trying to get at. The, questions bring, the question that's asked brings about the expected answer from the priest. No, you can't become holy or consecrated that way. Food cannot become holy or consecrated that way. On the other hand, the second question comes about a transfer of defilement. And defilement under the Old Covenant works different. Numbers 19.22 spells this out within the second question here. It clearly teaches that one would be defiled through transferred contact with someone who has touched a dead body. Okay? One is unequivocally, clearly defiled by transferred contact with someone who has touched a dead body. They would become unclean. So just a summary of all this, okay? I don't want to get much into this because I think it's clear what Haggai is trying to get across. A summary of all this, what the law is teaching them, and listen to what it's teaching us. Under the old covenant, it's much easier to become defiled than it is to become holy. I'm going to say that again. The old covenant is teaching the people and us today. It's much easier to become defiled 
than it is to become holy. So the priest answered, yes, it does become unclean. If someone come in contact or food becomes in contact of someone who's touched a dead body. Listen to the point that thunders home in verse 14. Look there with me. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people. And with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so, with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. So this moves from an abstract question and becomes very personal. It makes me think of when prophet Nathan approaches David and he tells him a parable do you remember this story and, and David's enraged he's getting into it oh yeah I know the answers oh yeah 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 and then Nathan says you're the man it's you're the one who's guilty this moves to become very personal very quick quick when the Lord reveals to them that it's their condition their condition is unholy it's defiled notice how the lord addresses the people he calls them this people this nation that's language of disassociation it's showing the lord's displeasure with his covenant people and this would have shocked them when i came to this text this week it shocked me just being honest it's not what I would expect. I mean, think about go, what we've seen in this book already. I mean, the Lord stirs them out of their apathy. They begin rebuilding the temple. The Lord encourages them in their work. They just seem to be moving up and up and up. It seems like we're on this trajectory. And then this comes. I mean, if I put myself in their shoes... And I'm hearing this from Haggai. I would be tempted to think, what are you talking about, Lord? We, we've been obedient to you. We've done what you've asked us to do. We started building this temple like you wanted us to build. We've been faithful. And the Lord in his omniscient, steadfast love, wants them to see past their change in behavior, and he's revealing to them the deeper condition of their hearts. He wants them to see past a change in their behavior and to see the condition of their hearts. Do we know more about the, some of the specifics of what's going on here? In the background. Well, the text doesn't tell us exactly those specifics, but I think we can have a good idea about what was going on with their previous sacrifices, their previous offerings. What is some of the history that has marked them that might give us more information about this situation? When, you, when we investigate the background, a helpful passage that I found this week was in Ezra chapter 3. This is describing a season of life just before when the Lord stirs them up to continue work on the temple. But this is describing a season in Ezra chapter 3. If you have time this week, go read Ezra 3. But it gives us some helpful information about their con condition. And specifically, what it tells us in Ezra 3 is about their previous offerings that they've been sacrificing to the Lord. Ezra 3 says that they offered lots of offerings, lots of offerings on an altar that they had built. And then it says something interesting, why they built it and why they were doing these offerings. In Ezra 3.3, 3, it says, because fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. And the text goes on to say, as it's describing their offerings that they're doing, it says, but these offerings were being offered before the temple was built. So there, it it's, should be flagging to us, something is incomplete about this situation. 
something's not right. They don't seem to have the right motives in, the, in how they're carrying out this sacrificial system. And there's something that is not complete about this situation, which is the temple. I think what the Lord's showing them and what he's pointing out in this indictment to them is a ritualistic going through the motions that we're all prone to, to be honest. Uh, Isaiah, at a different period of time in history, he speaks to this kind of ritualistic trap. Y'all know this passage in Jeremiah, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 29, 13. It says, these people honor me with their lips, their hearts are far from me, and then it says, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Let me ask you a question today. Is the fear of the Lord for you just a doctrinal point in your mind that you've checked away and you tell others that you fear the Lord because it's convenient to your family or it gives you some kind of social advantage or capital? But it's not more than just a doctrinal point for you. We can fall into this very same trap, can't we? Of ritualistic, going through the motions. Jesus quotes this in Matthew 15, doesn't he? What the Lord is showing his people in these verses is their superficial attempts at holiness have utterly and completely failed. Because their worship has been done primarily in the fear of man. The background information helps us to see that. It was polluted with insincerity. It was hypocritical. It was without their hearts. He's also pointing out that they've been casual and careless in their observance of God's commands. They're trying to make sacrifices with no temple. And in the institution of the tabernacle and in the institution of the temple, God makes clear the sacrifices were to go with with these structures. That, that's how the Lord designed it. The Lord was purposeful in telling them that. One of the things that has plagued God's people at different points in redemptive history is breaking the second commandment. The second commandment, most of us know the second commandment, it's a prohibition to not worship any false gods. Okay? But that's not all that the second commandment prohibits. The second commandment and the ten commandments. It also prohibits trying to worship the one true God in the wrong way. Trying to worship the one true God in a way that seems right to us. That has played God's people. Just, just an aside uh, here. Because of this temptation throughout the scriptures of God's people to try and approach the Lord on their own terms rather than the terms he has set, we want to be careful with how we structure our services here on Sunday morning. This is a temptation that marks not only the people of God in the Old Testament, but the people of God in the New Testament. To, to do things that seem right in our own eyes, but it's not what the Lord has required of us. So when, when we structure our services here on Sunday morning, we want to pay careful attention to the instructions that God's given us in his word. What has he told us to prioritize? And that's why when we come on Sunday, we read the word because God tells us in the New Testament to have the word of God read. We preach the word because he tells Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. We pray because of 1 Timothy 2. First of all, Paul says, I urge you that prayers and supplications be made. We sing the word to one another because of Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 because we're commanded to do that. We take the Lord's Supper. We baptize because Christ instituted those things for his church to take part in. And we dare not set that aside, right? Right? We do not set any of that aside for something that seems right to us if we had more time, which we don't. We could go to, to Genesis 4 
and the sacrifice that Cain brings to Abel that the Lord doesn't approve of. We could go to Exodus 32 and Aaron making the golden calf. And the text says he wanted to to offer this to Yahweh. He thought Yahweh was going to be impressed with his golden calf. That did not work well. We could go to Leviticus 10 and see Nadab and Abihu coming before the Lord with a great idea to offer strange fire before the Lord. And that went horribly. Do you remember that story? We could go to 2 Samuel 6 and see King David throwing the Ark of the Covenant on the backs of ox because that was an easier way to transport the Ark. And he disregards the instructions of the Lord. He uses a pragmatic method to get the Ark, and that ends in a catastrophe with Uzzah. Do you remember that story? All of those are examples of what happens when we turn to our own wisdom, our own ideas, our own, well, this is just what works. And we try to approach the Lord. And these people said, you know what? I don't even, I don't think we need a temple. That altar over there looks great. Let's just, let's just have some sacrifices without a temple. But it's not what the Lord had required of them. The Lord tells them they're defiled. And it says every work of their hands is defiled. Do you hear what he's saying to them? Think about how demoralizing that would have been to hear. Their hands that they're using to put up the holy temple, the Lord is telling them are defiled. That, that would have been like hearing, okay, how are we to put up the holy temple then if our hands are defiled? We can't do it. It's impossible. Well, it seems like it's a hopeless situation, but the Lord does not leave them here. He keeps pressing on in fur further revelation to them. He continues to reveal redemptive purposes he has for his people. And he reveals to them that his desire has been to bring them to repentance, true repentance, and ultimately to bring them back to him. And that's our second point, that we see God's people in this middle portion disciplined and in need of repentance. In verses 15 through 17, disciplined and in need of repentance. Read verses 15 through 17 with me. Now, now then consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you in all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not Turn to me, declares the Lord. I hope you caught some of those words. It, it should sound familiar because a very similar thing is said to the people in chapter 1. But he says nearly the same thing to them again, but then he adds to it. And, and I think he's helping them see, and us today, the purpose, the purpose of God's loving discipline in their life and in our lives. The Lord is calling them to consider, remember that word? It's been a repeating word, consider, consider, consider. To reflect upon the misery that's been theirs. All of the curses from Deuteronomy 28 have come upon them. They're showing and proving that they haven't been living with their hearts inclined to the Lord and in obedience to Him fully. And fundamentally, listen to what the Lord describes as true repentance. Repentance. He first says, he struck them. The language in Hebrew there is incredibly strong. I struck you. O often we, we're uncomfortable talking about the Lord in ways like that. But the Lord is not uncomfortable about talking about himself in that way. I struck you, he says to them. But he says they've not turned to me. I struck you, but you did not turn to me. So listen, here's what he's saying. Repentance is not a redirect to another task. It's not just start obeying 
Start obeying. No, true repentance is turning away from our sin, and it's turning to the Lord. Turning away from our sin, and then turning to the Lord, most, most fundamentally. Church family, I, I want to press that just a little bit into our hearts this morning. Because with these people, darkness, defilement, was hiding in their hearts. They were hiding behind their service for the Lord, their work for the Lord. And I want us to see, church family, that God has given us this text today for his sovereign purposes in our lives, to think about that in our own lives. Do you not realize how prone each of us is to avoiding the deeper problems of our heart, hiding from heart issues in our life and sin issues through our service for the Lord, through our activism, through our busyness in the church. And the Lord is saying to them and to us, he's not impressed. He knows our hearts. And ultimately, he doesn't need our service to accomplish his purposes. Church family, consider your heart this morning. Consider your heart. Here's a question for us today. Are we hiding darkness, defilement in our hearts behind busyness and service for the Lord? Are we hiding? Are we putting up a facade that everything is great? I've got this Bible study. I'm, I'm a greeter at this door. I'm, in, I'm a leader in my class. I, I, I volunteer at, at, at Seals. I what, what, whatever the list is, we're so good. And, and those are all good things. Hear me. And the appearance can easily become, they're doing great. But we're prone to hide defilement in our hearts and deeper problems behind our busyness, our activism, our service. And I want to exhort us today, flee that temptation this is fruitless. Just another aside about our Sunday gatherings here. We schedule deliberately times in our service to slow down and be quiet and consider because of temptations just like this in our hearts and lives. We, we, we love to just run on past things quickly. And the Lord wants over and over throughout Scripture to slow his people down and get them to consider something going on in their hearts. So it's why last week we had a, a prayer of confession. It's why we regularly do things like that to help us contemplate, to consider, God, what are you doing in my heart? What are you showing me? What is still there? What are temptations that are still in my life? What is sin that's crouching at the door and its desires to have me? What To consider these things, to not just get you in here and get you out in the most expedient way, but to help us consider what the Lord is showing us from our hearts. Flee the temptation to hide behind just activism and busyness. The Lord desires you to return to him this morning. Then out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, in a text that's almost completely, overwhelmingly a rebuke, the Lord directs his people towards hope and blessing in spite of their failure in the last couple of verses. And what seems to happen here in these final two verses is the Lord anticipates the effectiveness of his word to them, the effectiveness to bring them to repentance. Though the text doesn't describe that, it seems to anticipate it. And it would make sense when we've seen the effectiveness in the past two sermons that we've heard. The effectiveness of God's word 
to bring about its intended result. The Lord, anticipating this, promises to bring his blessing to them once more. Read verses 18 and 19 with me. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is there seed yet in the barn? That's a question. It's a little unclear in the ESV and some of the translations. It's a question that expects a negative answer. Is there seed yet in the barn? The, the, the question expects a negative answer. No. Is there seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. That last sentence should hit you like a waterfall of God's grace to them. The Lord gives them a promise from this day on, the 24th day of the ninth month, he will bless them. He tells them to consider that even when they started again the Lord's work, since they began working on the foundation of the temple again, even that obedience wasn't enough to bring God's blessing. And, and that's the point of the beginning of verse 19. Then the Lord says something wonderful to them. From this day, I will bless you. Ultimately, the Lord is showing them here his unmerited favor. He shows grace to a defiled, unholy people, and he promises to bless them from this day on. He proves to them what he had told his covenant people long ago in Deuteronomy chapter 9. I'd have you write that passage down in your notes if you're taking them today. Deuteronomy 9 he tells them, ultimately, God will not bless his covenant people because of their righteousness. He tells them that clearly in Deuteronomy 9. But because of his unwavering commitment to the covenant that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You know, what was the blessing? What is the blessing? Well, the immediate context is that God is going to lift the covenant curses from them that he's described in this passage and in chapter 1. He's promising to lift the covenant curses, to bring crops back, food back. But I don't think that's the ultimate blessing in light of what Pastor Blair is going to preach next week. You need to come back if you're able next week and hear how Haggai finishes up. It's not the ultimate blessing because we're going to see next week that God is not only to committed, committed to his covenant he made with Abraham, he's committed also to the covenant he's made with David. That one of David's sons will always sit on the throne and rule over God's people. And we're going to discover next week what the ultimate blessing is and what will come through a king. How do we respond to this today? Three quick responses. First, consider your defilement. Consider your defilement. Two types of defilement. Everybody, biblically speaking, in this room is defiled, okay? The first kind of defilement is a Genesis 3 type of defilement. That's every single human being after the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. Romans 5 says, through one man's sin, it brought sin and disobedience to the entire human race. And there are some people in this room that are under condemnation from God and they're defiled, they're unholy because of sin from Genesis 3. And they, they have not found provision in the Lord yet. And if that is how you are defiled today, I want you to know God has made provision for cleanliness. God has made provision to wipe away sin, to cleanse us from every sin. We were singing about it over and over this morning. The defilement that marks your heart, if you don't know the Lord today, can be cleansed through the blood of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Haggai is going to point 
to him. He was pointed to last week when the, with the promise of a new temple that will be more glorious than this previous temple. And in this place, he will give peace. That's one kind of defilement. You can find cl- cleansing in the blood of Jesus Christ today. Come find me after service. Come find any staff member, any pastor, Justin, Corey's down here at the front. Find someone next to you who looks like a committed Christian. Ask them about Jesus. They would love to tell you about him. But another kind of defilement is a Romans 7 kind of defilement. I know there's overlap between Genesis 3 defilement and and Romans 7, but hear what I'm saying. If you're here and you're in Christ, the Bible talks about our war with sin in Romans 7. That we will be in a war with the defilement of our flesh until we see the face of Jesus. And God has called us to greater holiness. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says this, Since we have these precious promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. What is the Lord, through his Holy Spirit, revealing to you about defilement in your heart? It may be different for each one of us. Do you have an accountability group that that you can confess and, and help you turn to the Lord and not just turn to distractions? Turn to the Lord, church family, when you discover defilement in your heart and maybe the Holy Spirit has shown you something that he, he wants you to address today. Number two, we should consider our repentance. Consider our repentance. Have we turned to the Lord in our repentance so that we could find true blessing and deep heart change? Or like I said a moment ago, or have we just turned to distract ourselves through service or busyness? The Lord is not ultimately interested in your service. He knows your heart. He wants your heart to turn to him. When you and me, sinners, saved by the grace of God, turn and come to the Lord, he can make us something that we are not presently. This is, this is what sanctification is, us going to the Lord. Those who are weary and heavy laden, coming to Christ who forgives us and who continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to continue to make us more and more holy. And lastly, we consider the grace of God. We should consider the grace of God today. We've said this before on Sunday, but God's grace doesn't look great to you and me unless we understand our defilement. The hope that God gives to you and me in the gospel isn't that glorious unless it moves in to a completely hopeless heart that you and me have. That's the wonder of this passage today. I hope you've seen yourself in the people of God in our passage today. The gospel isn't glorious unless we realize how hopeless and how defiled we all are. But God in his grace has sent Jesus to us. It's not a coincidence, church family, that at the end of last week's sermon, the Lord points us to a greater temple, and in that temple he would bring peace. It's not a coincidence that he moves right from there to pointing out the defilement in their hearts. And the reason is, is because the peace that we all long for The greatest peace that God could ever give is peace with him. It's the greatest peace that we all long for in our hearts. And that peace is available to us because of what Romans 5 says. We can have peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we get peace today. That's the peace that solves our greatest problem, church family our unholiness before a holy God. So we consider God's grace today. And in just a second, the band's going to come. We're going to sing before the throne of God above. 
And I just want to ask you today, I want to encourage you today to sing these particular lyrics with great joy and with confidence today. This is what the lyric says. I know that while in heaven he stands, Jesus Christ, our great high priest, our perfect mediator, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can say you and me are condemned if we have been wrapped and clothed in the holiness of Jesus Christ, in the righteousness of Christ. So in the overwhelming rebuke of this passage, consider the grace of God in your life. Consider the gospel afresh today. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending your son, a greater temple that would die in our place and rise three days later. And everybody who turns from their sin and trusts in him can have his righteousness cover them and be cleansed from all of their defilement and sin. So God, help us today in awe and wonder, praise you for your son the greater temple. Praise you for the greatest blessing you've ever brought to us. It can never be taken away from us. No condemnation before a holy God. I pray we would respond to you today in the ways that you would call us to be faithful. Holy Spirit, lead us in our response today in song and offering and everything else we will do the rest of this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.